Okay, so um, today we're going to do basically, yeah, as I said, the proof of the Chernoff bound and moment generating functions. And so again, let me just describe the basic setup that we have. X1 to Xn are independent Poisson trials. And this is just terminology to say that each Xi is an independent, it's sort of like an independent Bernoulli with a different probability. So each of these represents a coin toss with a different heads probability. Uh, and so for the Chernoff bound gives you sort of an upper tail bound and a lower tail bound. And I said, you know, so epsilon is between zero and one. So you have a deviation of being more than epsilon times the expectation or less than epsilon times the expectation. And if you remember from the last lecture, we were also discussing concentration bounds for the sums of squares of Gaussians. And what I want to tell you is basically how the proof of the Chernoff bound, the basic technique essentially works to prove, uh, to prove that actually that is more direct than than the Chernoff bound, than this Chernoff bound. So note that epsilon being between 0 and 1 uh, is an obvious constraint here, but not so much over there. So for the upper tail, uh, you know, what happens, what happens when epsilon is much, much larger than one, which makes sense, right? What is the probability of having many deviations, of, of deviating much more than the expectation? And we will see that bounds of this form are going to be very necessary when we start doing more sophisticated analyses. So for, you know, the main content of today's lecture is I want to explain sort of a sharper upper tail bound, describe the various regimes that are there. And then, you know, I, um, <clears throat> and then I ho hopefully that will, that will show you, you know, that will give you some sense of when you apply various kinds of bounds. So note that there are, there are two, I'd say, weaknesses here. So one is obviously this constraint, which is a weakness. The second is the appearance of the expectation. Suppose you had a random variable whose expectation was extremely small and you were trying to get the probability that that random variable is extremely big. So for example, suppose we wanted to know what is the probability that the summation of xi is, let's say, greater than r when r is much, much larger than the expectation. then can we get some bound here? Now the problem is if you apply a bound of this form, you get e to the minus epsilon squared, you get the expectation, but maybe the expectation is really small and you're trying to understand deviations on something much larger. So actually the original, or I'd say one of the usual upper tails that are shown for independent Poisson trials when, when these are not the same Bernoulli, uh, actually is sharper and does give you bounds for those regimes. Uh, except it's somewhat of a messy bound and it's usually simplified to various forms. So let me show you sort of the sharper Chernoff upper tail bound. And I'm going to use some notation here. So x is going to denote the summation of xi i going from 1 to n mu is going to denote the expectation of x. And remember, this is just going to be the summation of i going from 1 to n of pi. Recall that pi is just the expected value of each xi, which is equal to the probability that xi is equal to 1. <coughs> and so the probability of x going more than 1 plus delta times mu. And in this case, I only need delta to be greater than zero. So delta is allowed to be more than one. Okay, it's going to be somewhat of a long, funny expression. It's e to the delta divided by one plus delta to the power one plus delta mu. Okay, so this is this is the sharper Chernoff upper tail. And I will show you how to prove, I will do a proof of this. Before I get into the proof of this, let me just tell you how this bound is derivable from this bound. Okay, so when 
delta is less than 1, one can essentially, you know, approximate one plus delta as e to the delta. And if you plug this in over here, then what you get is that e to the delta divided by one plus delta to the power one plus delta. This is e to the delta divided by e to the delta plus delta squared. And of course, the whole thing is taken to the power of the expectation. And this gives you e to the minus delta square mu, which is what you expect. You know, one, when you actually do this, you're going to start losing some constants, and that gives you the divided by 3. But note that even when delta is much, much larger than 1, this bound still says something interesting. So what it says is, I mean, and you, you can sort of see that when delta is much larger than 1, so let's just say that 1 plus delta is much larger than e. In this case, the denominator subsumes the numerator. And you can sort of approximate this bound. I mean, and you know, one has to do it more carefully, which I will do, is you can approximate this bound simply by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta to the mu. Now, this is a nice expression here, because this is exactly the deviation you are interested in. And what you can get is that you'll get this thing, this bound over here, is something like 2 to the minus r, where this is r. So what this means is that the probability of being more than r is 2 to the minus r when you are looking at deviations that are much larger than the expectation itself. The nice thing about this expression is that it's sort of independent of mu. So when delta is much smaller than 1, you approximate, you just do a Taylor approximation, 1 plus delta is e to the delta, and you get back your our well-known delta square mu. But when delta is much larger than 1, then the denominator here essentially completely subsumes the numerator. The numerator is much smaller. So let's just ignore the numerator, and you can we can do it more formally. Uh, we'll do it more formally. In this case, your expression is just 1 divided by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta mu. And note that when delta is much, much larger than e, or 1 plus delta is much, much larger than 2, you can just write this as 2 to the minus r, where r is actually, you know, is 1 plus delta times mu. So you're trying to understand, look at the probability that x is greater than r, and that becomes less than 2 to the minus r. Okay, so I'll write out the formal statement. I'll write out the formal, you know, the, the, this version formally. But let's first do, let's prove this version. So any questions about, about this? Okay. Can you move it slightly Yeah, sure. So uh, any, any questions? OK, if not, let me continue. So how does one actually prove the Chernoff bound? Uh, I think you know it's so it, there are, you use what's called the moment generating function. So for a random variable x, the moment generating function is a function that's denoted f of t is the expectation of e to the tx. Like this is the moment generating function. It's related to the Fourier transform and I don't want to get too much into sort of the functional analysis aspects of this. So let's just, you know, let's use the, the moment generating function. Uh, to give you some intuition into why one would use such a function, let me, you know, let me, um, let me first talk about the most simplest concentration 
which is Chebyshev. And then we'll start from Chebyshev, and then we'll go on from there. Okay, so what is the Chebyshev inequality? That simply says that the probability that x minus mu is more than k times the standard deviation of x is at most 1 minus k square. Okay, so how does one prove the Chebyshev inequality? How does one prove the Chebyshev inequality? Use Markov on which quantity? Exactly. So what you say is, so we can say that um, the variance of x is the expectation of x minus mu squared. Right? So the probability that x minus mu squared is going to be more than k times the variance I'm sorry, k squared times the variance is at most 1 over k squared. This is just Markov. You take square roots and you get this and you get the square root of the variance which is the standard deviation and this becomes Chebyshev. So you took square roots inside. Now for convenience you know, let us center x so you know reset I'm gonna somewhat abuse notation here I'll just say reset x to be x minus the expectation okay so therefore the expectation of x is 0 right? this is just going to be convenient for this description but um, so I'm just mo shifting it so that the expectation is 0 in which case the variance of x just becomes the expectation of x squared. Now note that this argument over here can be generalized to any even moment. So we could look at the expectation of x to the t and let's say t is even right and then apply Markov on it apply Markov on this. So what you could do is you could say what is the probability that x is going to be more than uh, what is the probability that x to the power t is going to be more than k to the power t of the expectation of x to the power t. Now you apply Markov here and you get 1 divided by t to the k uh, I'm sorry, 1 divided by, my apologies, 1 divided by k to the power t. Now take the tth root. Now remember, t is even. t is even. So you'll get that the probability that the absolute value of x is more than k to the tth root of expectation of xt is at most 1 divided by k to the t. This is also known as the tth moment method. So what this says is if you can bound the second moment, that's the variance, then you get Chebyshev. If you can bound the tth moment, then you get a much better then you get the tth moment method. Now observe that there is a trade-off here. As t increases, the tail bound, the tailbone probability decreases and it decreases exponentially in t, meaning that if you increase t, you get an exponential improvement in the bound, which is good. On the other hand, as t increases, the expectation of x to the t increases. So you have a trade-off here. As you increase t, the probability starts going down but the expression over here starts going up. Now what do you really care about 
you care about the probability that the that x is going to be greater than some lambda this is what you care about so you could write lambda you can write lambda as k times the the th root of the th moment and choose the best t to sort of optimize this right because if you fix the deviation for every t you're going to get some k sub t right the t is the, 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 the that that the multiple is going to depend on t and so you could try to choose the best t because at some point t is going to increase but k is going to decrease and so you trade these things off there is a trade off here does this make sense yeah. yeah and so you could use calculus to choose the best trade off and what the moment generating function does is you know in some sense basically allows you to do this in a smooth way that that's sort of one way of looking at how to use the moment generating function okay so observe that these functions these are all you know non-negative convex functions they're all non-negative convex functions and that's why I use the fact that t is even and when you have a non-negative convex function what you do is you basically you compute the expectation of that function and then you apply Markov on it because it's non-negative you can apply Markov and indeed what the Chernoff bound says the Chernoff bound basically is apply Markov apply Markov on the moment generating function expectation of e to the tx so what you want is the probability that some x is more than lambda so let me just take out the absolute values you want x is more than lambda so no absolute values you'll say well that's the probability so let's just say um, yeah so pick so for t greater than 0 You'll say that's the probability that t times x is more than t times lambda, which is exactly the same as the probability that the e to the tx is greater than e to the t lambda. And now you can apply Markov. And then you would get, by Markov, what you get is that you take the expect, you take the deviation e to the t lambda divided by the expectation of that. Okay, so this is your bound, and this holds for all t. And then do calculus to choose the best t. And any bound, I mean, I, I've read that any bound that has been obtained in this form is referred to as a Chernoff bound. Okay, so this is the basic process. So any questions about this? Any questions? Okay. So now let's let's go ahead and let us apply this process to the Bernoullis that we all know and love. Now so x in our case was the summation of xi. So let's not even, we don't even need to do the centering now. Right? There's no need to actually center the random variable for the moment generating function because this is always, this is always um, non-negative. Right? So the key over here is this is non-negative. Or rather I should say this is non-negative. Right? So because it's a non-negative random variable, you can apply Markov on it. So 
our random variable was of this form. So let's first look at what is the moment generating function. So something, and this is really where independence is key. So we know that the expectation of t to the x is the expectation of e to the t to the sum of xi i going from 1 to n. And this is now independence. So the product, the expectation of the product of independent random variables is the product of the expectations. So I get this. And now I just need to compute this quantity, which is the moment generating function for a Poisson trial, which is a coin flip. And this ends up being a relatively simple calculation. Okay, So the moment generating function of the sum is the product of the moment generating function of each individual random variable. And this is crucially where the independence is used. <coughs> okay, So now let's go ahead and write this out. So remember that xi is 1 with probability pi and is 0 otherwise. So what is this expectation now? What is this expectation? So it's pi e to the t uh, plus something. plus 1 minus pi. Right? So this is the expectation. Okay? So now <coughs> let's go ahead and let's kind of let's kind of do all of this analysis with the initial setting that we had, which is we are trying to understand the probability that x is more than 1 plus delta times mu. So let's go ahead and apply this where you know we could now express this as lambda. So I'm being a little casual with the inequalities and equalities. So let me be a little more careful here. So what I get by using the Markov trick over here is I get this is e to the uh, e to the let me see if I'm doing this correctly have I no I saw so, I'm sorry I, I've my apologies I I have fudged this expression I wrote my Markov incorrectly this is actually the expectation of e to the tx divided by e to the t lambda. Right? My, my apologies. So obviously, like as this quantity increases, the probability should go down. OK, okay so there's, there's my Markov here, right? Because um, just, just, to be, just to be clear, because no one caught that. So remember, I can write e to the t lambda as e to the, I'm sorry, uh, e to the whatever, t lambda divided by the expectation times the expectation, right? And this is the number of deviations over the expectation. I get the reciprocal of this. That's the Markov here, OK? So, OK, so what I get is e to the t x divided by e to the t 1 plus delta times mu. Right, so there it is. Okay. 
So I just applied I just applied Markov on the moment generating function, and this is what I get. This I can now write as the product of i going from one to n of the expectation of dxi divided by e to the t one plus lambda times mu. Okay. So I'm just going to sort of follow this over there. And this is equal to, as we discussed, the product of i going from 1 to n of pi e to the t plus 1 minus pi divided by e to the t 1 plus delta times mu. Okay. All right. So, so far, so far, so good. Now the question is, what do we set t to be? Okay. How to set t? How to set t? And this is where now you know you sort of have to choose the right approximations. To make this work. Obviously, as you increase t, the denominator is increasing. It's increasing exponentially. On the other hand, the numerator is also increasing. So what are we going to choose t to be? So for simplicity, let's just ignore this quantity for now. J just let's just do a back of the envelope calculation. Let's ig let's ignore ignore that for now. And or well, let me. How best do I how best do I describe this? So I'm just I'm just going to rewrite just going to rewrite this expression as one plus pi e to the t minus 1 divided by e to the t 1 plus delta times mu. Okay. So what I get is the numerator is the product of n quantities. And if I increase t, each of those terms increases exponentially. So it's the product of n terms, which is increasing exponentially. And here also, I have you know I have something similar where e is increasing exponentially with t. But you'll see that if you set t to be too large, the numerator will dominate. And if you set t to be somewhat small, then the denominator will dominate. So there is some trade-off point that you need to choose. So using the approximation 1 plus x is at most e to the x, I can write this as the product of i going from 1 to n of e to the pi e to the t minus 1 divided by e to the t 1 plus delta times mu, which I'm now going to write as e to the summation of pi e to the t minus 1, i going from 1 to n, divided by e to the t times 1 plus delta times mu. OK, so what is the summation of pi? What is the summation of pi? Which is mu. So I get e to the mu times e to the t minus 1 divided by e to the mu times t times 1 plus delta. Okay, so this is the expression that I get.
So what I get is that this quantity is doubly exponential in t. The denominator is singly exponential in t. So I'm playing with exponents here. So let me just do, again, eventually I'm just going to set some value of t, which I can do using calculus. Like I can write this out as a function. I can derive it. I can, de I can take the derivative with respect to t, and I can get some value. Or what I can do is, you know, I can stare at these expressions and ju do a judicious choice. So let me just tell you how you can do a ju judicious choice by looking at this expression. So you need this denominator to be more than the numerator. So you need mu t times 1 plus delta to dominate mu e to the t minus 1. So these are going to disappear. And so here's the expression I get t t times 1 plus delta should be e to the t minus 1, should be greater than e to the t minus 1. Now, if you stare at this a bit, you see that if you set t to be approximately delta, you get delta times 1 plus delta here. And here, you get e to the delta minus 1. Now, of course, you know, and, and so what you get is, and you'll see that this, this is actually greater than that, just by writing out the Taylor series approximation. So when you set t to be delta, then things seem to approximately work, meaning that the denominator is larger than the numerator. So let's go ahead and basically set t to be delta and see what bound we get. So we're going to set t to be delta. Okay, I'm just going to write this expression out over here, which is the probability that x is greater than 1 plus delta times mu is at most e to the mu e to the t minus 1 divided by e to the mu uh, mu t times 1 plus delta. And we want to set t to be approximately delta. We're eventually going to take e to the t, so it's going to be convenient. Let's set t to actually be the log of 1 plus delta. Okay, because the log of 1 plus delta is, you know, is really is, is approximately delta for small delta. Now, the key to note is a lot of these approximations that I did over here, like a lot of these assumptions, a lot of these calculations was for small delta. This is for small delta. When I said this is greater than that, that's for small delta, not for all delta. On the other hand, we want a bound that holds for all delta. So what you can do is you can use the small values to give you the intuition to plug in the right expression. And you know, again, if you wanted, you can do the calculus. And you'll get that if you set t to be the log of 1 plus delta, then you, know, you minimize this expression. And you can see the logic behind that for small delta. Note that when delta is large, of course, you know, the Taylor's approximation is not going to hold. So let's just go ahead and set it to be this quantity. And what you get for that expression is you get e to the mu times 1 plus delta minus 1 and e to the mu 1 plus delta log 1 plus delta. Or alternately, I can also say this. I just said e to the t to be 1 plus delta. And so what I get in the numerator here is I get e to the delta mu divided by 1 plus delta to the power 
1 plus delta mu which is e to the delta divided by 1 plus delta to the 1 plus delta to the power mu right and this gives me the turnoff bound to get the probability that x is at least 1 plus delta mu is at most e to the minus delta square mu divided by 3 for delta in 0 1 to get this you just you know you use a normal Taylor series expansion right so you basically what you do is so I'm not I'm not going to work this out here but what you can do is you can show that essentially 1 plus delta 1 plus delta is so let me just write this out carefully over here what you show is that 1 plus delta is something like is greater than e to the uh, let me do this carefully yeah so what you do is this is approximately e to the delta but this approximation is not formal obviously so to formalize it you have to use to formalize you use more terms in the expansion of e to the delta and you'll see that if you take a second degree approximation of e to the delta then you can get things to work so you need to use a second degree approximation and I'm going to leave this as an exercise it's not a very difficult exercise you just have to be a little careful with the math here and so what you do is you try to replace 1 plus delta with e to the power delta you know, minus something okay and then and once you do that you can get the math to work out but a very interesting and important bound which is often overlooked uh, especially uh, and I've noticed this is especially overlooked by students many times is you know when they think turn off they always think this bound which is of course the most commonly used bound but there's another very very useful form which says the probability that X is greater than R is at most 2 to the minus R for any R that's 6 times mu and the 6 is just a convenient constant you can get a slightly better constant it turns out to be not that important in many applications and again what you do is you go back to this bound you know, this is the bound that is the most important this is the bound that is the most important and often you, you you won't see this bound really appear in papers as much and people will use forms that are derived from this bound so what we say is when r is at least 6 mu so let's just write this out as r is our 1 plus delta times mu so 1 plus delta times mu is at least 6 times mu meaning that 1 plus delta is at least 2 times e and so we can just write this out fairly you know just just using you know doing it pretty much trivially is to write this out as say this is at least e to the 1 plus delta divided by 1 plus delta to the 1 plus delta to the power mu I say this is at most e divided by 2e to the power 1 plus delta mu which is 2 to the minus r okay 
And so what this says is the probability of having a really large deviation, that is you're deviating at least six times the expectation. Right? The probability that x is going to be more than six times the expectation is just 2 to the minus r, so it's an exponentially decreasing in r. You don't even need to know what mu is exactly as long as you have this bound. Very convenient form. Another aspect to observe is suppose mu is theta of 1 and 1 plus delta is really much, much larger than, than constant. And 1 plus delta is much larger than a constant. So again, like using this sort of behavior, but without simply plugging in and, and you know, plugging in a, a simple approximation of that form. If you observe, again, just let's just, you know, again, we can write this out as E divided by 1 plus delta to the power 1 plus delta mu. Right, so if mu is theta of 1, and 1 plus delta is much, much larger than a constant. So roughly speaking, the r that you get over here, which is the 1 plus delta times mu, is essentially just theta of 1 plus delta. Right, so what you get over here is that you get e divided by 1 plus delta to the power r. And again, when r is, you know, this is, I'm just describing a specific situation where mu is theta of 1 and 1 plus delta is much, much larger than a constant. What you can write over here is you can basically write this as r to the minus theta of r. Right, because 1 plus delta, 1 plus delta is essentially just r up to constants. Okay, so, so these are sort of three forms that are very useful for the upper tail. To get x being greater than 1 plus delta times mu, you know, this is the usual bound that we see when delta is small. That's e to the minus delta square mu divided by 3. A convenient form is when r is actually much larger than 6 times u and you want the probability that x is greater than r. That's just 2 to the minus r. And another version, and we will see, we will see applications of both of these versions, is, you know, suppose mu was theta of 1 and 1 plus delta was much larger than a constant. So your r is essentially theta of 1 plus delta. Then you get a bound that looks like r to the minus theta of r. And you know this is a this in many settings can be better than that bound over there. And so uh, let me let me pause right now, and I'll take any questions. And after that, I will talk a little bit more on how one gets concentration bounds for sums of squares of Gaussians. So continue, and you know just to <coughs> just to recap, I mean. For the lower tail, what you do is, again, you try to write things in terms of the moment generating function, but you have to use moment generating function at negative values. So what you say is the probability that x is less than 1 minus delta times mu. Well, you say for all t greater than 0, this is the probability that minus tx is greater than minus 1 minus delta t mu. And then you exponentiate, and then you just do the moment, you just do essentially the same argument that we did before. The calculus is going to be different. But the um, the idea of the analysis is exactly the same. So you know a few a few points. So note that our proof was for Poisson trials or coin flips. 
you know what about arbitrary distributions arbitrary distributions in 0 1 Right now, it seems that it's a lot harder to write out the moment generating function exactly. You knew what was going on. So how will we deal with arbitrary distributions in, in the range 0, 1? In the range 0, 1. Any, any, any thoughts? So it turns out the same bound is going to work. Indeed, the same proof is going to work. And all it requires is one careful observation. So remember, it all boils down to understanding this expression, which is the moment generating function of each individual random variable. And when it's you know a Poisson trial or a coin toss, we know exactly how to write it. Now think about for any distribution in 0 and 0, 1, what do you think is the worst case for the moment generating function? What is the worst case for the moment generating function? What do you mean by a worst case? Okay, so Consider the expected value of e to the t x i, where x i is distributed distributed in zero one. Which distribution? Which distribution maximizes? the moment generating function. Like intuitively, do you want x to take different values or similar values? I'm sorry? It always takes one. Okay, so good. But what if x is distributed with a fixed mean? So fix the mean. So let's say the mean is pi. So you're allowed to pick any distribution whose mean is pi. How do you maximize that quantity? Deviate from the mean as much as possible. And what is the distribution that is going to deviate the most from the mean? It's exactly a coin flip, right? Because it takes extreme values. So what you get, and another way of looking at this, is e to the t x i is, a, is convex. Right, it's some convex function. And so the logic that you use is that which is essentially like, it's like Jensen's inequality, which basically says that a convex function, a uh, convex function lies under the line joining two points. I mean, this is, you know, badly, badly phrased, but you under, but hopefully you get the point that if I take any two points and I take a convex function between the points, the convex function always lies below the line joining those two points. And because the convex function always lies below, essentially what you get is if you have to choose distributions that fix a mean, it's beneficial for you to kind of move the values that the distribution takes as much as possible. Essentially what you can claim is that 
the expectation of e to the dxi is always at most the expression that we got for Bernoulli's, which is you know pi times e to the t plus one minus pi. So essentially, this is saying that coin flips are the worst case. The worst case. And so whatever logic we have, whatever proof we had, also works for arbitrary distributions in 0, 1. I mean, just assume that, I mean, these are, you know, relatively well-behaved distributions, right? I don't want to have weird Cantor sets or, or, or strange distributions, but anything, any reasonably well-behaved distribution, then you can, where you can define, where all of these quantities are defined, as long as you can define the expectation, then this expression will hold, and then the entire proof goes through as is. I mean, it, you have to be able to define the expectation. Okay, sure. So the expectation is an integral, and for the integral to be defined, you need the distribution to have some well-behaved property. So. Yeah, and I I don't want to go down that whole measure theory analysis route, so I'm just saying, you know, assume expectations are defined for any function of the random variable, then this then this expression holds. So the turnoff bound as stated is is an extremely flexible tool. All the bounds described hold for arbitrary distributions as well. So it's um it's it's you know, it's very convenient and what this means is, in general, you can always rescale your distributions to 0, 1. This will, of course, rescale the mean, and so the, res the scaling factor will affect your bound. But the point is, you can basically deal with arbitrary bounded random variables. You will get some dependence on the bound. But you can just apply the Chernoff bound as is. A much bigger question is the role of independence. So what if things are not depend independent? So sometimes, instead of this, what you get is an upper bound. And that is good enough. So sometimes you just get an upper bound over here. And these are, these are also referred to as uh, negatively associated random variables. So there are random variables which are not necessarily independent, but because if they're negatively associated, then you can replace the pro you can replace this equality by an inequality, and as long as you have an inequality going in the right direction, the whole proof goes through as is. So one can generalize the Chernoff bound to not just sums of independent random variables, but sums of random variables where this upper bound holds, and there's a class of random variables for which this happens, and, uh, and again, the proof will go through. So this is sort of my overall take on the Chernoff bound and the proof. And again, like if you want to see proofs of the lower tail, many are available online. You can even try to do it yourself. It's not particularly hard now that I've given you the logic and the basic ideas. Um, I want to take, maybe I'll take some time discussing the sums of, um, of, of Gaussian, uh, squares of Gaussians as this is what we needed for the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma. And um, so there are a few concepts here which I think are worth discussing. So remember for, for the JL proof, uh, for JL, we needed concentration for the sums of squares. of Gaussians. And so it's convenient. So now let's just I'm gonna say x is a normal distribution with variance sigma squared. If you look at the moment generating function for this quantity, you get e T squared sigma squared divided by two. You know, it's it's an integral 
uh, you can work it out so the moment generating function has an extremely well-defined behavior uh, very easy to state behavior for Gaussians and there is a notion of we'll say, I'll say X is Sigma sub Gaussian if the expectation of E I'll, I'll use a different random I'll say Z E to the TZ is at most E to the T square Sigma square divided by 2 for all T and we say that Z is Sigma sub-Gaussian up to T0 if this holds for all T that whose absolute value is at most T0. So now just sort of generalizing our discussion further when you have the moments or the moment generating function of the Gaussian any random variable whose moment generating function is upper bounded by the moment generating function of a Gaussian essentially satisfies all the nice Gaussian tail behavior and this is specifically referred to as a sub Gaussian and you can even think of one of the ways in which the Chernoff bound works is basically it's showing that it is sub Gaussian you know under certain under certain uh, in certain regimes and then we can talk about you know sort of the the, the main lemma which is really this can be thought of as the Chernoff bound is that if Z is Sigma sub Gaussian up to T0 then the probability that Z deviates more than K times Sigma is at most 2 to the minus the expectation minus k squared divided by 2 uh, for all k in 0 to let me just make sure I get this correctly uh, 0 to t0 okay so what this is saying is that if z is sigma sub Gaussian up to some t0 then essentially you get you know Gaussian type concentration bounds that deviating more than k times the standard deviation of course the standard deviation of sig of z might not be sigma but you can use it as a proxy because z is sub Gaussian and if it's sub Gaussian up to some t0 then you can get that many standard deviations you can get a bound for that many standard deviations Is this so? Um, I, I sh I'm okay. So sorry. Let, let me. Let, let, let's just say that the expectation of z is zero. So let's center it. My apologies. I should have said this is centered, right? Because I'm looking at the normal. So in this case, you would essentially, you know, you you would ignore. Um, I mean, the the mean doesn't appear. And in, and in many descriptions of the proofs of the Chernoff bond, usually they will center the random variable. For the case of the of the Poisson random trials, it wasn't really necessary. I mean, it would have only it would have only made some expressions more messy to get back to the same expression. But in general, you would center the random variables. That way, that way, you know, sort of the variance is exactly the second moment. So, of course, the proof of this lemma is is by now you know we've seen we've seen this enough times and you know you just say that the probability that z is greater than k times sigma is equal to the probability that e to the tz is greater than e to the um, t k sigma for all t greater than zero and then now we can do Markov here so we'll get the expectation of TZ 
divided by e to the t k sigma. And now the expression that we get over here is because this is sub Gaussian up to t0. Sorry, it is sub Gaussian up to t0. So this is the sub Gaussian. This is the sub Gaussian here. You can say this is um, e to the t square sigma square divided by 2 for all t at most t0. I should say just keep this over there divided by e to the t k sigma. And again, you have this sort of behavior where the numerator increases faster as a function of t than the denominator. But what you do is you go ahead and you pick the largest value of t that you can plug in here, which is t0. And so what you get is, I'll just write this out, you get e minus uh, t square sigma square divided by 2 minus t k sigma. And so now we need to choose whatever our value of t is going to be. So, um, so remember that if, if you, if you, again, just, if you sort of equated these, you get the choice of t that you need. And so sigma, sigma goes away, t and t go away. And so what you need to do is you need to set t to be equal to uh, two k divided by sigma. So let's just go ahead. Let's go ahead and plug the expression in over here. So suppose we set t to be equal to k divided by sigma. Then this is going to become equal to t square sigma square. So that's k square sigma square divided by 2 sigma square minus uh, k square sigma square, which is minus k square sigma square divided by 2. And so what we need is we need to be able to set t to be at most that. And so as long as k over sigma is less than t0, then it works. I think I may have uh, missed something here. I need to make that sigma t0. Right, so sigma t0. So as long as z is sigma sub Gaussian up to t0, then my apologies, I mean, I should have been more careful. Uh, the number of standard deviations I can get is, you know, sigma times t0. And so this is essentially just the Chernoff bound calculation. And this obviously works for a Gaussian itself. So for a Gaussian, you get this bound here. And when you show it's when it's sub Gaussian, then you kind of get this bound for any random variable, you know, which of course has this sub Gaussian property. And you can kind of generalize, you can generalize this argument by saying that um, sums of independent sub Gaussians is a sub Gaussian. Just like sums of a Gaussian, sums of independent Gaussians is a Gaussian, you can show that sums of independent sigma sub Gaussians is a sigma sub Gaussian. So you can argue that uh, x squared where x is, you know, is sort of sub Gaussian, um, or I should say technically x square minus the expectation of x square because I want to center it. So you can show that this is not exactly sigma sub Gaussian, but you know, it's, it's like root 32 sigma squared sub Gaussian, 
up to 1 divided by 4 sigma squared. So you can you can essentially prove sub-Gaussian properties of x squared where x is normal and this is actually just a lot of math to crunch out because you know exactly what the moments look like. You know what the moments of a Gaussian look like so you know what the moments of the square of a Gaussian look like and then you use this fact then you use the fact that sums of independent sigma Gaussians is a sigma sub Gaussian and then when you have something being a sub Gaussian then you have a Chernoff like tail and this would really give the full proof uh, of the Johnson Linden Strauss uh, bound that we talked about um, so what I'll do is you know I I have some notes that I can that I can that, that I can put up um, I don't want to go through all of this math right now because I don't think there's particularly there's any direct utility in me doing it over here in detail but this hopefully gives you some idea of how one would prove the full Johnson Linden Strauss bound so any questions at this point any questions Okay, um, then if not, I think uh, I have about, I have less than 10 minutes left. Yeah, go ahead. So yeah, any bounded distribution, like anything which is bounded is sub-Gaussian up to that bound. So this is sort of an alternative way of looking at this Chernoff discussion that we just had by saying you can take an arbitrary distribution. You can show that any distribution which is bounded is sub-Gaussian or up to some bound with the right choices of the standard deviations. And then you can use that to then actually show that sums of sums are sub-Gaussian. So a lot of these calculations are sort of generalizing the calculations. Of course, you know, the exact calculus on how to choose the right value of t and all, you know, might become a little messier uh, if you did it in more generality. But you you can, you will recreate the same bounds. Okay, so instead of, you know, starting a new topic, what I'll do is I'll just stop here and I will take questions for the remainder remainder of the time.